Okay, good afternoon. I am Tom Hudako from the Utah Department of Health, going to get today's daily COVID-19 media briefing started. Uh, today we'll be hearing from Dr. Angela Dunn, who is the state epidemiologist with the Utah Department of Health. She will be providing us with a situational update. Uh, following Dr. Dunn, we've got Joe Doherty here from the Division of Emergency Management. And Joe is going to make himself available for any questions that there might be about uh, this morning's uh, earthquake, the aftershock, and also any questions maybe about the Utah shakeout. So, uh, Dr. Dunn? Okay, good afternoon. Today we are up to 2,683 cases of COVID-19 identified in Utah. That's an increase of 141 from yesterday or a 5% growth rate. We've tested 49,678 Utahns for COVID. That's an increase of 2,064 from yesterday, and we're still maintaining that 5% positive rate. We do have an additional 17 hospitalizations for a total of 238 hospitalizations during the COVID-19 outbreak and maintaining a 9% hospitalization rate. We do have an additional death to announce today. We have 21 total deaths. The additional death is in a male from Salt Lake County. He was over the age of 85 and passed away in a hospital and was a resident of a long-term care facility prior to being hospitalized. Our healthcare staff are currently working with the long-term care facility to ensure that all staff and residents are tested for COVID-19. So going back to January, we have developed and distributed trainings to all long-term care facilities in Utah about protecting their residents against COVID-19 in preparation for this pandemic. And we've also had a response plan in place for what happens when a long-term care facility identifies a COVID-19 case. We work with the facility to implement infection control practices, such as cohorting patients and staff. And we make sure that all the staff have the adequate personal protective equipment so that they can provide care in a safe way to all of the residents. Our Utah Public Health Laboratory has stood up a mobile specimen collection unit, and they're able to go to all long-term care facilities when a case is identified and test both staff and residents for COVID-19 on site. The Utah Department of Health is also developing teams of healthcare providers who will be deployed to long-term care facilities in the event that they need a surge in medical care capacity. So this is gonna allow the regular long-term care facility healthcare providers to quarantine or isolate properly. And then the healthcare providers that are being deployed will be able to provide safe and quality care to the long-term care facility residents. I also want to note that our dashboard has been updated on the coronavirus.utah.com website. It has a lot more data points, including case rates by health districts, um, recovered and active cases, as well as additional demographic points. Okay, with that, I'll take some questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, as you know, this afternoon, the, uh, the President Trump uh, plans to announce national guidelines for things opening up again. Um, I know we obviously we're not going to have any knowledge of that, what those guidelines are at this point. But is Utah on that timetable or is it on their own timetable? How is the state going to respond to these guidelines this afternoon? Yeah, exactly. So without knowing exactly what those guidelines are going to be, um, I want you guys to know that we are developing Utah-specific guidelines based on metrics and the outbreak and how it's going here in Utah so that we can safely open up the economy in a staged approach um, so that we can constantly monitor kind of when we open a little bit of the economy, how does the pandemic react in Utah so that if we need to make it more strict, we can move back, or if we can loosen up even further, we can do that. Um, so we are making a Utah-specific plan um, that should be announced in the coming days. And just to follow up really quickly on that, um, if things are opened up, let's say, too quickly, and suddenly there's a influx of new cases, mm -hmm. um, what will that do for the you know month and a half, two months that people have done to self-isolate and, and, uh, and do social distancing? Um, will it make that work just a waste at that point? No, not at all. I mean, that's why we have to be flexible um, in our approach to reopening the economy and also be very diligent at watching the data coming in so that 
in the event that we are, you know, identifying additional cases, as you say, or start to see a surge on our healthcare capacity, we can quickly implement those social distancing restrictions again to ensure that we can save um, our hospital systems as well as um, keeping Utah safe. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, Dr. Dunn, uh, I've got a pair of questions for you. I'd like to ask you the first one and hear your response first. Um, when are people the most contagious with COVID-19? Is it before they show symptoms or after? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, that's a great question and something that scientists across the world are trying to understand of when someone is infectious and when are they no longer infectious. What we know about other coronaviruses is that people have the highest viral load, so most infectious, at the beginning of their disease when they're showing the most symptoms. Um, that's when the viral load is highest and people can transmit it very effectively. Um, of course, we will be learning a lot more about COVID-19 specifically in the coming months and years um, to be able to target that time frame more specifically. Um, but right now, based on other coronaviruses, what we know is that at the beginning of the symptom onset is when people tend to have the most virus in them. Okay, and then my second question for you is, is that we're learning today that law enforcement may be keeping some of their officers on duty after coming in contact with a person who may have COVID-19 or, ha or potentially have COVID-19. What is your recommendation to administrators who are faced with this predicament? Should they keep their officers, our first responders, on the front lines, or should they pull them until they are tested and come back with a positive or negative result for COVID-19? Sure. So I don't know about those situations specifically, but in general, um, we have very clear recommendations about people who have come into close contact with a confirmed COVID case. And so people who have come into close contact with a confirmed COVID case in general do need to quarantine themselves um, and, and stay away from others for a 14-day period. And, and they're actively monitored by public health, assessing them for symptoms daily. There are some exceptions in that guideline um, with regards to critical infrastructure workers, you know, specifically healthcare workers and potentially first responders. But we deal with those on a case-by-case -case basis um, and weigh the risks and benefits in those situations. But in general, if somebody has direct close contact with a confirmed COVID case, um, we do recommend quarantine for 14 days. Thank you. Doctor, a couple of questions. The first one is, um, Spencer Cox made a comment on KSL News Radio that, uh, if, and I'm paraphrasing him, that essentially Utah has flattened the curve. The first question is, um, do you s agree with that assessment? Do you see it that way? And number two is, if that is true, how can we make sure that we don't behave in a way that would, you know, make us see another spike? Yeah, so um, we have seen really good signs here in Utah with our data in terms of a slowing of the growth growth rate in Utah. So it is potential potentially a sign that we have started to flatten it. Um, but as you mentioned, we have to be very careful this early in the slowing of the growth rate because kind of any misstep could just, you know, set a wildfire off and we could start seeing a spike in cases again. Um, so we need to give it at least a couple of weeks of this continuous flattening um, before we can make assumptions about the trends. And um, when it comes to uh, how you define flattening of the curve, um, what officially does that mean? So it's what we're looking for is a slowing of the growth rate for at least two weeks. So that's one incubation period. And then after that, what we would see to confirm that we have flattened it is an actual drop in our cases. And so seeing a decline in the cases. We are seeing an additional increase in cases every day. However, that growth rate has been slowing over the past several days. So, so the signs are good, but I think we still have to wait a little bit longer before we can have good confidence in that. So just paraphrasing, there are signs that maybe we have flattened the curve and it might look like it, but still um, kind of, uh, we, we still have to wait and see a little bit more. Yeah, and I think that's a, you know, that's a really good point. It's essential that we continue the social distancing measures we have in place along with isolation and quarantine to really push us over the top of this curve and so we can start seeing a decline. Okay.
Thank you, Dr. Nunn. Two questions. Um, first, you talked a lot about testing this week and trying to get more people tested. Overall, how would you say the state feels about where it's at with testing? Would you say the state feels it's in excellent shape? So in terms of where we are with testing, we have unmet capacity. So we are able to test approximately 5,000 people a day for COVID-19. And for the past week, we've been below that, you know, around 2,000, 1,500 tests done a day. We're encouraging anybody with even the most mild of symptoms to contact their provider or go to coronavirus.utah.com to look for testing locations um, and get tested for COVID-19. So that includes fever, cough, shortness of breath, muscle aches and pains, um, sore throat, or a sudden loss of taste or smell. Um, if you are experiencing any of those, no matter how mild, certainly seek out testing. It is very important for public health to have a clear picture of everyone who's infected in the state of Utah so that we can better inform policy and public health intervention. Um, and because we have the capacity to do that, we should be using all of our testing. Okay, and then also uh, House Speaker Brad Wilson said today, he, or he called for a gradual reopening of the economy to begin by the end of this month. Do you think that's likely and prudent? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's a great goal to have, and we'll have to continue to watch our data points, and hopefully we continue to see a slowing of the growth over the next week or so, followed by a decline in cases. And, and those are great signs that, you know, we can start looking into this slow reopening um, as long as we're vigilant about our, our data collection and testing continuously. Hi, Dr. Dunn. Uh, my question is also about testing. Um, I was wondering if you, if the Department of Health is tracking uh, who's getting tested uh, by age group or other demographic groups. Uh, and the, the reason I want to ask that is, is there any certain group you're seeing that's, you know, not getting tested as much as, as we want to see or, you know, not seeking out testing? Uh, basically, is there any, you know, age group or demographic group that, that you know, we haven't reached as far as, as needing to get tested. Yeah, um, so the way we're looking at our data and focusing our analyses now are starting with our hospitalizations and positive case rate, looking at disparities within those, and then seeing if testing is part of um, contributing to those disparities. Currently, um, as we mentioned, I think it was yesterday or the day, to, day before, we are seeing our Hispanic community um, bearing an undue burden of positive and hospitalization due to COVID-19. Um, in terms of age groups, we know that hospitalization positive are due to you know, uh, a higher age range, greater than 65. Um, but we haven't started to break down our data in terms of rates of testing. Um, but we do have the data capacity to do that. So um, we'll start looking at that in the coming days as well. Hi, uh, I understand that the state's guidelines for testing still require certain symptoms and a doctor's referral, um, but we're hearing that TestUtah.com is offering tests to some asymptomatic people. And I'm wondering why does TestUtah.com have different testing guidelines than the rest of the state? And if they're testing everyone with symptoms or not, why shouldn't all providers open up testing for everyone? Yeah, so our statewide guidelines are a consensus that's built between the Utah Department of Health, Utah Public Health Laboratory, AREP, University of Utah, Intermountain, Stewart Healthcare, and HCA. So we bring all of our statewide experts to the table to understand what they're seeing on the ground and their expertise in terms of virology and pandemic response to come up with the best criteria for testing based on our testing capacity and where we are in the outbreak. And those six symptoms I defined earlier are the exact criteria that this group agreed upon to implement statewide. Our goal is to have these guidelines implemented so that no matter where a Utah goes to get tested, they know what to expect um, and have a similar experience regardless of the testing site. Um, so that's the goal we're seeking to achieve with all of our testing partners. So what is, I guess is your, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. What then, why then is the testutah.com group that has been promoted by the governor issuing tests that are in a different way from those guidelines? Yeah, so it, it's my understanding that they're looking to come on board with the guidelines that have been set by all the subject matter experts across the state. Um, and that's what we're recommending to them.
Yeah, uh, Dr. Dunn, thanks uh, for taking our question. So I think you just sort of answered exactly what I was going to ask, too. You know, we are getting some reports that people are taking the survey through the utahtest.com site. They are not symptomatic. They have not come into contact with the known positive. And they're, they're a little, they've got some anxiety that they're being flagged to be tested. Uh, and again, I joined a little bit late here, but do you know, is the algorithm changing? Uh, if you could just expound on that a little bit more. But again, I think you, sure. you sort of touched on it in your last answer. Sure. So we at the Department of Health are working really hard um, with our partners to gain greater visibility of the algorithm so that we can understand the demand of testing a little more accurately and also be able to interpret the results better as well. Um, there is a place for asymptomatic testing in this pandemic, um, but it's necessary to have a very thoughtful approach um, in terms of recruiting who should be tested if they don't have symptoms. Again, so we can accurately interpret those results and use good data to inform policy moving forward. So we are working with partners across the state to um, figure out uh, the best strategy for to use this excess capacity for testing, which definitely includes asymptomatic, but it does need to be a very strategic plan that involves all of our partners so that, so that again, we understand the results and, and how to apply them to policy and intervention. And just one quick follow-up, uh, when I reached out a little bit earlier today to the governor's office, they had mentioned that there were some errors that are being worked through. Do we know what those errors are and what is being specifically worked through with respect to that? Yeah, so I actually don't have um, knowledge of those errors specifically, um, but I do know that we're working with our partners to make sure that it's a streamlined approach um, from kind of all the testing sites to the Department of Health um, down to the public as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Joe Doherty. Good afternoon. For the last few years, since we started the Great Utah Shakeout in 2012, we've joked that wouldn't it be great if there was an earthquake on the day of the shakeout to remind everybody that Utah is earthquake country. And uh, today, everyone got that uh, reminder that we had the, a magnitude 4.2 aftershock related to the Magna earthquake that happened on March 18th. And it's just one more reminder that Utah is earthquake country, that we live in a place where the earth shakes, and we all have an opportunity to do something about it. So because today is the great Utah shakeout, it's our annual earthquake drill, we are inviting everyone across the state to be very creative with how you will prepare for earthquakes today. You can go to shakeout.org slash Utah, and you can read all about uh, different ways that you as a family might participate and then we're calling on anyone who might be holding some of those virtual meetings today to consider a virtual shakeout drill to practice dropping to the ground, taking cover and holding on. We've learned that through our contacts and social media and through all of you who have reached out to us that many people during an earthquake and our recent earthquakes are getting up and running to another location. They're trying to leave their houses, they're leaving their beds, and, uh, and really the best thing to do is to make sure that you are staying in place because an earthquake could very easily drop you to the ground if it is uh, something pretty severe. Uh, large earthquakes have been known to throw people to the ground, and uh, any time you have a fall, you put yourself at risk for severe injuries uh, to your extremities or to your head. And what that does is it makes your own disaster recovery really, really challenging. And so that's why we use the shakeout every year as a reminder to drop, cover, and hold on to something sturdy if you can, if you can be by something like that. Um, if you're in bed, stay there, provided that you do not have um, shelving or a heavy picture frame. Uh, or your favorite trophy sitting above your bed. So um, we just thought that this would be a great opportunity to remind everybody about the shakeout drill. And yes, we are very conscious of the fact that we had a magnitude 5.7 earthquake um, just about a month ago, and we've had multiple magnitude 4 aftershocks as a result of that. And we hope that what that will do is help a lot of Utahns remember that when we do have even a moderate earthquake, we will continue to have aftershocks that go for many weeks. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions if there are some.
Hi, Joe. Um, I was just wondering if you're aware of any uh, building damage from either of these 4.2 aftershocks that happened this week. You know, fortunately, um, a magnitude 4.2 earthquake is what we would call a light earthquake. Um, the shaking that results from that, even though it, it triggers a lot of people's anxieties and it can feel large, it's, it's a very small amount of energy that's being released. And so we have received no damage reports uh, and no injury reports. And we were really fortunate that even in the magnitude 5.7 quake we had in March, uh, there were no injuries from that. It, it could have been something where we would have seen injuries had people been hurt by falling brick that was coming off the outside of buildings, uh, but we were really fortunate. Yeah, Joe, have you been able to learn any more about, or has the Division of Emergency Management or the Utah Geological Survey been able to learn any more about this particular fault line and, and why we are experiencing what we're now at like almost 1,250 uh, aftershocks so far? So there's a lot of research that's still being done, and the Utah Geological Survey will continue doing that research. Um, I, I don't think we have exact information on what fault uh, these earthquakes are occurring on right now because we do have the Wasatch Fault uh, that most of us are very familiar with that runs from Malad, Idaho down to San Pete County. It's split up into about 10 segments. But across uh, the Salt Lake Valley, we have numerous other faults. And the one you're probably referring to is the West Valley Fault Zone, which also exists. And, um, and these earthquakes are, are occurring in, a, in an area that's very close to those faults. I think the one thing that's really important for people to remember is that an earthquake fault isn't just the line that you see on a map, is that it's really a big cross section of earth that we are all walking around on all the time. And that whole fault, uh, where we are all sitting can drop. And the type of faults we have here in Utah are called normal faults, which means they're the kind that slip away as the earth expands. And so um, we, there are numerous faults out there and uh, it's just more research that is being done in that area. And so I expect that we could find out more about that in, in coming weeks or months. Hey, can you tell us how the Great Shakeout went today in its virtual format? Were there things that couldn't be enacted that normally would be? Yeah, so normally for the Great Utah Shakeout, um, every year we have these very big public drills. Every school district in the state participates, and that's where most of our participants come from. And so what we did this year is because we couldn't have people gathering in locations like schools uh, or even in many workplaces, we were asking people to conduct virtual drills. Um, we know that uh, a couple employees in the uh, state EOC uh, did a drill, got under a table, um, because we, we participate in the Shakeout out every year as an agency. Um, but uh, this year is going to look a little bit different. One other thing that we did is we asked um, all of those organizations to consider um, if they wanted to hold their drill at another time of year, they're welcome to do that and still be counted for 2020. So if you were to go to shakeout.org uh, slash Utah, our, our Utah Shakeout website, you would see that we have about 650,000 people registered to participate today. Um, and we are still uh, looking for some of those responses of how well that went for them. Um, because we had an aftershock today, that has been most of what we have been dealing with, is talking to people about that aftershock and how we do expect to see these magnitude four aftershocks continue. Um, some people feel like they're actually getting bigger. And the way that we look at it is, in the very beginning of the, the first earthquake we had in March, you had a big spike and a lot of earthquake activity with um, some magnitude fours there. And then you go for a little bit of time and you have uh, a spike in activity every so often. But overall, we're seeing the overall activity decrease. Okay, thanks very much, guys.